All right, so continuous random variable. Again, we talked about discrete random variable. Discrete random variable, remember that was your x. And we had to set up our little tables and we had x and it usually went something like this was our x and we had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then you had your probability of x, each one of those. Well, now instead of just dealing with things that you can count, remember continuous, when we talked about this last chapter, that's things that probably have to be measured. They have to be measured. They have to, something like uh, ounces of water in a cup. Um, weight of a person or whatever because it's not something that just always falls on a whole number. The one that the example I use here, time spent studying, well somebody might study for an hour and 10 minutes. Somebody else might study for an hour and 12 minutes, hour and 13 minutes, hour and 14. So it's not something that we can break down into just 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Now what's going to be different, and the, the key idea here that you have to remember is last chapter we were dealing with uh, normally with histograms. And I'm just going to draw a histogram here real quick. kind of shape does that histogram have? Symmetric, all right? Now, what we're going to do, last chapter we went, like if this was 0, 1, 2, 3, and we wanted to find the probability of getting something below 3. So we just looked at the area inside those three rectangles. What we're going to do with the continuous is you can't really do that. So now what we're going to do is use that bell curve that we had at the start of the year. And it's going to look like this. Well, you notice if I'm finding the area below 2, or I'm sorry, below 3, the area under that curve and the area of those rectangles is going to be real close to being the same. Because even though this tip of this rectangle sticks out, a little bit, so that's extra area. We also miss a little spot right here on the curve. So when we approximate those, they come out to be pretty close. And that's what we're going to do this chapter. But we're going to use the curve instead of using the rectangles. Does everybody remember all the stuff about the bell curve? Hopefully some of it. Camden remembers it all right, Camden. Mm -hmm. A normal distribution is a continuous probability distribution for a random variable x. So it's something that doesn't go 0, then 1, then 2. It goes 0. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.21, 0 0.22, 0 so on and so on. So it's a continuous run instead of having just those separations. This is the most important thing in statistics, the way this is distributed. Lots of things in the world, even though you don't think it would, Lots of things in the world, and we talked about this when we talked about the bell curve, fit that curve. Things in nature, even though you wouldn't think it, they fit that curve. Or really, really close to it.
The other name for this, normal curve, bell curve, either one of those is a fine name. I don't care which one you call it. There's probably a mathematical right and wrong answer. So if you go out and you become some great statistician, Sydney's going to make sure that she's not calling it the wrong name by then. She'll know everything by then. But there's probably some, some reason that you call it a normal curve one time and a bell curve another time. Anybody remember anything about a bell curve? Isn't like the middle portion like 65 percent, 63 the very edges are like 43. Like 70. I don't know. I don't, let's say it's 68 and 34 and 34. 34 and 34? I don't know if that's it, but I actually have that. That part's right. What What is this? Where is this cutoff at? Um, One what? Oh. One standard deviation from the mean, above and below. Hopefully all that's going to come back to you when we get to it here in a couple minutes. Properties of a normal distribution. This middle right here in the center, where if we cut it, it's symmetric. That's the mean. All right, that's normally your mean. That's what we talked about as being the mean all the time. In a normal distribution, the mean, median, and mode are all equal to each other. They all fall right there at that symmetric line. So not only is this the mean, but it's the median and the mode also. So if they give you a normal curve, and they ask you to find the mean, median, and mode, should it be real difficult? If I gave you this normal curve right here, oops, the wrong direction. What's the mean? You can read my writing. 72, what's the median? 72, what's the mode? 72, they're all the same. If it's a normal distribution. Normal curve is bell-shaped, symmetric about the mean. Hopefully you remember that. Uh, the total area under the normal curve, this is something you didn't remember a minute ago, so you might want to make sure you remember this. Total area under the curve every single time is 1. So if the total area under this curve is 1, what would the area under that side of the curve be? 0. 0.5. What would the area going the other way be? 0. 0.5. So if I wanted to pick some random number, what's the chance that I pick that number right there? If it, if, or I'm sorry, let's not do that. What's the chance that I pick a number that's less than that number? Half, 0.5. That'd be the probability. All right. So the probability of picking something less than the mu, 50%. Probability of picking something higher than the mu. 50%. Normal curve approaches but never touches the x-axis. It extends out uh, in both directions forever. So these spots right here where it looks like it's touching the axis there, it never actually touches it. In Algebra 2, you probably dealt with like asymptotes. Anybody remember asymptotes from Algebra 2? I remember the word. It, 
you had a line and the asymptote went like this and it kept getting closer and closer and closer to it but it never actually reached it. In algebra 2 it would have been, you would have had a curve on a graph, it would have looked something like this. You, you got some line, maybe your line was right here, and then you had a curve coming in here like this and going up. And then you had a curve over here coming in here like this and going up or something. And it kept getting closer and closer to that line, but it never touched it. That's sort of the same thing here. These are never going to touch the x-axis. So we're never, ever going to get all of the area under that curve. It's never, ever going to actually total up to one, but it's going to keep getting closer and closer and closer. So. We might get the area that's something like 0 0.9999997. Nine, 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 which is really, really close to one, but we'll never ever quite reach one. Because there's always going to be a little more out here that we are not going to get to. Uh, between So this is, before you start writing any of this down, this is your mu, that's your mean. Mu plus, what's sigma stand for again? Standard deviation. So mu plus one standard deviation, mu plus two standard deviations, mu plus three standard deviations. Down here, mu minus one standard deviation, mu minus two standard deviations, mu minus three standard deviations. These point where you're one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above, those points right there on the curve are called inflection points. That's where the curve changes direction, sort of. It's instead of curving down, now it starts to curve up when you get past that point. We don't do a whole lot with inflection points. Sure, there's something that they're that they're good for, but I haven't figured it out yet. Maybe I will this year. Maybe I'll learn something. Ms. Clark could probably teach it to me. Just as you're writing down, what do you know about the chances of getting a point or a number that's like right in there on the on the graph? If you're more than two standard deviations, Unlikely. it's a, it, which one? Unlikely. unlikely. What's the chances of getting something out here? Very unlikely. So more than two standard deviations away from the mean, unlikely more than three standard deviations away from the mean, very unlikely. Remember, if we're doing test scores, where Mr. Eversole would fall, Molly might be What's the area under this curve? One. Alright, just want to make sure. Today's your birthday? Yeah. What's the area from here over? Happy birthday. Thank you. I think we need to sing again. Yeah. 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 We've got too much to do. If we have time, I'll let you sing. The choir was recruiting me my freshman year, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it was. Not smart. He's just not no, here. We had a lot of smart guys in our grade. Like, we had a ton of smart guys. No, in our grade. I, 
I said you're still. I said he's still smart. You're just not here. Yeah, okay, fine. I should say. Did I say it wrong? Yeah, you said it wrong. We had a lot of smart. <laughs> Sorry, guys. that's not what I meant. We had a lot of smart guys that applied themselves. Now they don't apply themselves. They might still be smart, but I don't know. we could have a dude valedictorian, but that's definitely not me now. Inflection points. I wouldn't write any of this down. Uh, inflection points can be estimated at one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below. It's the same thing we just talked about. Remember, mu is the mean, sigma is standard deviation. If you don't know those two signs by now, I'm going to cry. So mu, mean, uh, sigma standard deviation. The ones you'll probably end up forgetting. What's the other symbol for standard deviation? S, what's the other symbol for me, uh, for the mean? X bar. Now we're doing just populations, so we don't use the X bar and the S near as much as we did back in previous chapters. I went the wrong direction. This class was hour long. Uh, prob a probability density function. Probability dis density function is like a histogram. That's the curve. All right? And when we're talking about probability, they just call it a different name. So it's the normal curve. It's just called a different name. This is the formula. If we were to punch this formula into your calculator and put in a couple of numbers and place in a couple of those variables, it would graph that normal curve for us. It would graph that normal curve. The only two things that we need to know to be able to punch this into the calculator, the mean and the standard deviation. Mean and standard deviation. We're not going to do a whole lot with this formula. We're not, I'm not going to have you graph it as far as on your calculator and be precise. I will have you draw a graph and draw a normal curve and be able to label it, you know, like maybe your mean is 50 and your standard deviation is 17, then you need to know, hey, from 50 I go out to 67, then from there I go out to 84, then from there I go out to 101, and if I go backwards I go down to 33, 16, negative one, so on, so on, so on. So be able to draw those curves, that's going to be a very important thing. Uh, draw your curve with your mean right in the middle, your mu in the middle, and then putting your tick marks, one standard deviation above, one below, two above, two below, three above, three below. So you write down this formula, we'll probably never use it. Some things you should know. What's pi? 3.14. Anybody know what E is? Get out your calculator and help. Punch the E button. Those two are constants. They're always the same thing. They're never going to change. The, the only place that you're going to plug in on each one of these is your, your mu and your sigma. Line of symmetry, uh, 
Remember your sigma, because on these graphs, and we're going to talk about this here in a minute, is every normal curve going to look like that? Does it have to look that way? Could I have a normal curve that looks like that? Yeah. What makes one spread more than the other is your sigma, your standard deviation. All right? So if you have a small standard deviation, you're spread less. Something like this would have a small sigma, small standard deviation. Something that's spread out more would have a big standard deviation. We'll talk more about that here on the next couple of slides. Means and standard deviations. A normal distribution can have uh, any mean and any positive standard deviation. Your standard deviation has to be positive. You have to be going up or down. It's like when I start walking. Just because I walk backwards, do I walk negative three steps? Doesn't work that way, does it? That's standard deviation, how much you're moving. The mean gives you the location of the line of symmetry. So the mean gives you that, what's going to be right here in the middle. Standard deviation describes the spread. So if our standard deviation is something real small, like I was just talking about on the last one, if our mean is 5 and our standard deviation is just 1, then that would go 6, 7, 8. Four, three, two, and our curve might look a little more straight up and down. If our standard deviation was 10, then we'd go, and our mean was 5, we'd go 15, 25, 35, and it'd be more spread out. So the standard deviation just tells or shows the difference in the curve, whether it's real spread out or whether it's real tall and straight up. So we're looking at this one. All three of these, well actually, these two have the same uh, means, but they're completely different curves, but they're both normal curves. Notice on this one, what's it look like the standard deviation is on this one? Looks like maybe just uh, if we go out a little bit here if we split it up into three parts. Maybe one. What's the standard deviation look like on this one? Maybe 0.5. Alright, so you see how it goes more straight up because the standard deviation is smaller. The bigger the standard deviation, the more flattened out this curve is going to be. So we could have a curve, a normal curve that maybe looks like this. It's real flat. That means the standard deviation was really big. These two look the same, except what's different about them. It's shifted this way, and all that's changed on that is the mean. Here it looks like the mean is about 3.5. What's it look like the mean is on this one? 1.5. Which curve has the greater mean on this one? A or B? Bigger mean? B? A. A because it's over that way farther, right? The mean for A would be somewhere right in there. So the bigger mean would be A. Now, what the rest of you were looking at, this one has the bigger what? Standard deviation because it's flatter. Which has the greater standard deviation? We just answered that. Which one is it? B. Because it's flat. Alright? It's more spread out. Uh, which curve has the highest mean? On this one, which one has the uh, highest mean? C. C has the highest mean. Uh, which has the largest standard deviation? B. Because it's more, see how it's flatter? more spread out. Uh, the line of symmetry, what would the line of symmetry for A be? Give me an estimate. 12.2 maybe? Probably accept that. Looks like we're about there. How about for B? 
13.1 maybe. How about for C? 14.8. 14 point what? Five. Five maybe, somewhere, I don't know, somewhere. Now if they're just asking for an estimate, not that big a deal. Uh, scale test scores for New York City uh, grade eight mathematics tests are normally distributed. The normal curve shown below represents this distribution. What is the mean test score? Estimate, uh, then estimate the standard deviation. So we're looking at this. How can we figure out what the mean test score is on this graph? What should I do, problem? Draw down the line, right? So maybe something like that. Does that look pretty close, fairly straight? So what's the mean test score? Six what? Six eighty. Now this says estimate the standard deviation. A little harder to estimate the standard deviation. How could we estimate the standard deviation? What do we know from where this line looks like it's almost touching out here to there? How many standard deviations should there be in there? Three. So if we're at 680 there, out here what would we be at? 580 right out there where it almost touches. What could we do with those two? Subtract them. What's 680 minus 580? 100. Now we want to split that up into how many standard deviations? About three. Because we want three standard deviations out to where it touches, right? Something about like that. What's 100 divided by three? About 33. So we could say the standard deviation, somewhere around 33, 35 maybe, to make it a little easier. Who knows? Uh, they said that we were a little off, so my line must have been a little crooked. 675, not too bad though. Standard deviation, they just picked these two points, points of inflection, defined it, divided by two, they said 35. We we're fairly close to that. On your calculator, this is how to graph the normal curves on your calculator. Write this, just this part down real quick and write down graph. You probably have to change your calculator window when you do this because otherwise it won't show you the, the entire graph. We probably won't do this very much. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to, the next slide has like three examples that we're supposed to do on your calculator. And I don't even think I'm going to bother with them because once you change your settings, you know from Mr. Alexander's class, once you change those settings on your calculator, then you got to go back and change them all back to do anything else on it. And that makes it sort of pain in the butt. Just because I can't remember if I do anything else with the graphing of these or not, probably be a good idea to write this down how to graph that normal curve. step so I knew how to do it. So if we wanted to graph a normal curve, if you did all this on your calculator, it would end up, it looks something like this. We're not, again, we're not going to do a whole lot with that because we're probably just fine 
will be looking more for, hey, what's the area of that part right there? I'm gonna skip this. Uh, standard normal distribution, very, very important. Using Z scores. So this is what we're going to do. Instead of like those graphs that we just had, we're going to change all of these into standard normal distributions. Instead of just normal distributions, we're going to change them into standard using standard scores, which is a Z score. That way, instead of having that graph like we just had and not knowing if this was 375 or 380, now what we're going to do is in the middle every single time, does anybody remember? When we change all these into Z scores, what's the number right there in the middle? Zero. Then we go one, two, three, and it just counts by the standard deviations. So now all our curves are going to look like that instead of having all these other crazy numbers on like 380, 5.2, so on, so on. So if we change them all into the standard normal distribution instead of just a normal distribution. Good thing about them, your mu is always zero. That's supposed to be a mu, not a m. And your sigma, your standard deviation, is always one. Once you change your scores into this, your mu is always zero, your standard deviation is always one. This allows us to compare bunches of different things. Compare your prop stats exam score to your chemistry test score. When we're doing one like this one up here, the top one with the 380, that's when we're dealing with the raw scores or the random variable X. So a raw score is where you just have whatever the numbers are. Standard normal is when you're dealing with just the Z scores. That's this one. That curve's always going to look like that. So standard normal is that. Uh, just the normal distribution is with whatever the numbers are. So we were doing something like the distribution of students at National Trail over the past 35 years. And we wanted the regular numbers, we just used the raw scores and we'd have a graph, maybe it looks like that. To find the z-score, z-score, remember you always take your value, whatever value you're dealing with, minus the mean, minus mu, divided by a standard deviation. I think we did some of that on the exam, right? Finding a z-score. So make sure you remember that little formula there. X minus mu over sigma. That's going to allow you to change this graph into that standard normal graph. Standard normal distribution area is always one underneath it. Uh, any x value, we already did all that. Any x value can be transformed into a z-score by using th that formula that we just talked about. That's what I was just saying. So if we wanted to change it, all we got to do is take all these numbers, Use that formula, change them into where our mu is zero and our standard deviation is one by finding z-scores instead of the normal. So normal distribution, standard normal distribution. Two different things. That table that you picked up, this table that you picked up, this gives you the area 
for standard normal distribution. Uh, this formula, this formula, you might want to write down. That's not correct. Right. Oh yeah, that's right. You already wrote down this formula. This is the formula for standard normal. Notice it doesn't have a sigma and it doesn't have a mu because mu is zero and sigma is one. So this is for the normal curve. This is for the standard normal curve. Two different things, normal, standard normal. Again, this formula is just if we want to graph it. So if you wanted to punch that into your calculator, you could graph standard normal curve. Properties of a standard normal distribution. I'm just going to go through, punch a bunch of this in real quick because I'm going to go through all these. Cumulative area uh, is close to zero for z scores, close to negative 3.49. So once you get down to negative 3.49, that's out in here somewhere. This area out here is really, really close to zero. That's all that's saying. What do you think the area, once you get out here past 3.49, what do you think the area out there is? Really close to zero still. There's not much out there on the ends. All right. And here in a second we're going to talk about what do you think the area is in there again? You guys told me at the start of class. Uh, 4, 6, 4. 60, 68. 68.68 or 68%. If we're at the halfway mark here, that's what the first one says. You guys have already told me, uh, told me this. What's the area over here? 0.5. On this table, if you look at the table, what the table does for you is it gives you the area to the left on the curve. So if I want to, uh, if I want to be at, let's draw this real quick. We're at zero, and we want to be at uh, one standard deviation. So we want this area down here to the left. What do you know about the area from here over? From zero over, what's that area? 0.5. You guys just told me what's the area between 0 and 1? 34% or 0.34? What's 0 0.5 plus 0 0.34? 0 0.84. So the area from 1 down under that curve should be 0.84, 84%. If you look on here, you notice it's got a positive and a negative side. If we look on the positive side and we go to under Z, we go down to 1.0 and we go over to zero because we want 1.0000 whatever, what's it say? 0.8413, right? So be able to use that. This comes in handy a lot of times because it's easier than the calculator some of the time. All right? If you looked at zero, let's say, we were just at zero, zero, you look right here, look at your z-score of zero, it tells you that the area under the curve from here over is 0 0.5000. So that's all you're doing, you're matching up this number and with the top, 
So if I wanted to do something like 2.27, go down to 2.2 and over to the 0 0.07, and it'd be 0.9884. That tells you the area under the curve from 2.27 over this way. Now, not every number is going to be on this curve. So if the number's not on there, you just estimate or get the closest one. It's showing you here how to do 1.15, go 1.1 over to 0.05, find it that way. So you could use a chart, you wouldn't even have to get out your calculator if you wanted to find negative 0.24. Go down to negative 0.2 over to 0.4, if I could see. So it should be right there. That's telling us the area from that negative 0.24 to the left, the area under the curve. These next three things, these are probably the key to all of it because you don't want to use the chart. If you want to use your calculator, this is going to tell you how. This one is area to the left. So make sure you write down these next three slides. <coughs> if we have this curve, our normal curve, our normal standard normal curve, and we want the area to the left. So we want from some number to the left. We're looking for that colored in area right there. This is the way we find it. So you hit second, bars. We've been doing that last chapter. We did it a whole bunch. Normal CDF. Now this doesn't have to be this, but what I do is I, we're going to, when we do this, we have to put in two numbers. We want to put in the lowest number that we want and the highest number that we want. All right? So I usually put in something like negative 10,000 because I want to go out that way as far as possible. Now if you just put in negative 1,000, do you really think it's going to make a whole big difference? Probably not. You could probably put in, who knows, maybe uh, Camden's favorite number is 6. He could probably put in negative 6 and it'd still be the same as negative 10,000. It probably wouldn't be a whole lot of difference. All you're doing is you're telling the calculator you're putting in negative 10,000 here and putting in whatever your number is here. You're just telling it, hey, I want to go from clear down here, negative 10,000, all the way up to there. I want to find all that area. Actually, this would be your Z score, not your X anymore. Next one, it doesn't look like it changed much. But what's the top say? Area to the right. So now we're looking at this. Don't look at that. Ignore that crazy mark there. Now we're over here and we're trying to find this area. So now what you put in your calculators, you put in your Z score as your low limit. And then I usually put in 10,000 as my high limit just so I make sure I get everything. Now again, these only work for
What's the other thing that could happen? We found the area to the left, area to the right of a certain number. What else could you do? One other option that we could be looking for. Area in the middle, right? So you could have two numbers. You want to find the area in the middle. So it might look something like this. You want to find that area. And that's what the next one tells you. Molly, did you get that? So this one, same idea, except this time, now you're finding the area between two numbers. So you're finding this. So when you put it in, you're going to put your low Z score, comma, up to your high Z score. So on all three, you're just doing, using the calculator on all three of them. Last chapter, what did we have to put in to find those areas? Instead of, we didn't just put in the score, what did we have to put in? What did you punch into your calculators when we were doing all that geomet PDF and what numbers did you need? Need the mu and the standard deviations, right? And that's the same idea here. If we were not using the uh, standard normal curve, and we're going to talk about that as the chapter goes along. Things that you should be able to do you got to be able to sketch these. Every single time, I want to see a sketch. So on the test, when it says find the area between 0.5 and 7.2, I want you to come out here and I want you to put 0 0.5, 0.72 is what I meant to say. You know, do something like that. Show me. Show me what the mean is on that and so on and so on. But be able to sketch that little graph so you know what you're finding. You're finding this area from here to there. Uh, we just did all that. To find the area to the left, we just did all that. I'll skip a whole bunch of this because I want to get to something else here. This is just showing examples of how to use the calculator or how to use, you could use the chart use the chart, you got to do a little extra. If you use the chart and you want to find this area here, what you'd have to do is find this, the area from here down, then find the area from here down, and what would you do to be left with that part if you were using this chart? The area from here down was 0.78. Area from here down was 0.32. How could we find this middle area? Subtract them. Just 7, 0.78 minus 0.32, that'd leave you with that right there. All right, so we could still use the chart and do all this. It's just uh, it takes a little more work. We wanted to find the area to the right using the chart. We'd have to find the area to the left and then subtract that from 1. That's what we were just talking about. Come on, come on. I don't know why I put that on there twice. This is what you were trying to figure out earlier. You wanted to Write it down again, might be a good idea. <coughs> One standard deviation each side, 
68%, 34% on each side, 13.5 for two standard deviations from one to two, and then from two to three is 2.35%. And each one of these could be a decimal. So this could be 0.135, this could be 0 0.0235, this is, oops, this is 0.34. Remember the stuff that's more than two standard deviations from the mean, from the x bar, the mu. Stuff that's more than two standard deviations away is unusual. Stuff that's out here, more than three standard deviations away, very unusual. Sixty-eight percent. In between one and two, or in between one and negative one standard deviations, 95% of all the data should fall within two standard deviations, and then 99.7% should fall within three standard deviations. So almost the whole thing should fall within three. Again, we call it the empirical rule. Some books call it the 68, 99.7 rule. That's your assignment, page 244. These little charts that are on here talk about critical values and the output <coughs> stuff over here and the tails. We'll talk about those later on in the chapter.